This is a message of thanks and gratitude to all you amazing Reluctant Preppers who are making Reluctant Preppers possible by supporting our mission on Patreon. With your help, we're overcoming a 75% drop in YouTube earnings because you're not standing still but are doing something about it and taking action by going to patreon.com slash reluctant preppers and pledging to keep us on the air. Now our team is 42 patrons strong and growing, and when we reach 100 patrons, we'll start sending out tokens of gratitude as a handwritten note from your host, Dunnigan Kaiser, and an autograph signed on a U.S. Silver Eagle to one of our patrons selected at random each and every month. If you haven't yet taken the step of joining in to support Reluctant Preppers, it's so easy. Just go to patreon.com slash reluctant preppers and pledge any amount you can. You guys are awesome. And we can do this together with your help at patreon.com slash reluctant preppers. Did you know you can buy silver at spot price? Get your 10 ounce bar of silver at spot price today. Go to sdbullion.com slash rp. Not only will you be buying silver without any premium, you'll also be supporting the independent media. Reluctant Preppers gets a small commission when you take advantage of this special offer. Going to sdbullion.com slash rp. That's sdbullion.com slash rp. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We're delighted to have a returning guest tonight. Carrie Lutz is the founder and host of the Financial Survival Network and author of Viral Podcasting. He was one of the co-hosts of and founders of the Liberty Mastermind Symposia that met both in Las Vegas, Nevada and Dallas, Texas, and brought in both speakers, panelists, and uh, attendees from all over the country and all over the world. He's here with us again on Reluctant Preppers to talk to us about his perspectives on the direction and major upcoming triggers that we need to prepare for in the financial world that are going to impact our financial lives. Carrie, thank you for joining us once again here on Reluctant Preppers. Hey, well, thank you for having me back. It's always a pleasure. If you could give us just a quick one-minute recap of the mission and progress of the Financial Survival Network. What is the Financial Survival Network, and what do, why do people need to know about it? Yeah, well, uh, I started it back in 2011, uh, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. And basically, my intent was to present as many different views and opinions to the public out there, those who are interested about financial matters, about where the country, where the world, uh, where the global economic system is heading. Because after the crash of uh, 2008, 2009, nothing has ever been the same. Nothing's gone back to normal. Normal doesn't exist anymore. So I felt that you really needed to get a lot of voices because everybody had a different opinion about what was happening why, well, we probably mostly agreed on why it was happening, but what was going to happen, what the future was going to look like. Uh, and still, to this day, uh, after doing close to 5,000 interviews, there's, I mean, there's general agreement on some of it, but there's widespread disagreement on a lot of it. And, you know, that's that's why I started it. And I feel like... In addition to presenting all these views, hundreds and hundreds of different guests, always on the lookout for different guests, uh, I felt like it would be thought-provoking and get you to think, because the decisions that you make now uh, really are going to be uh, potentially life-altering and life-changing, and that's why you needed to really think about this. And uh, I've never once during this over six year time period, doubted what I was doing or wondered, uh, is this worthwhile? Even if only one person was listening, although we've got tens of thousands around the world listening, but even if it were only one, it would still be worthwhile. And fortunately, a lot of people have tuned into the message. A lot of you out there have started thinking about what could be economically and there could be existential events coming up 
And it's been an extremely gratifying journey. You know, it isn't just my own personal journey, but the journey of so many of my guests and uh, so many of you out there who listen faithfully. Yeah, it's really astonishing. And it's actually my son who got me into this. And that is maybe a little bit unusual since most of our subscribers are in the uh, you know, later career stage or nearing retirement uh, stage of life, it seems like people who are really uh, have some sober life experience and taking things uh, quite seriously about their ability to become financially self-sufficient and looking about how to reduce risk uh, to their family and thinking about the generational impacts of what's going on. It's astonishing to me how completely inadequate, utterly inadequate any public education or other popular sources of information have been in my life uh, to prepare me for any kind of awareness, anything I could describe as awareness of, of what the real situation is uh, regarding the very, the very um, stuff that our money is made of and which is where we store, right, all of the fruits of our labors, of our life labor. We, you know, we, we work all life long and try to store that up to provide for ourselves and for generations ahead. And yet how we understand that is just, uh, just, uh, it seems so clouded and so full of ignorance. And yet it seems like the more people we talk to, and it isn't just people who are already of a preparedness mindset, but it seems more and more people are getting, uh, the, the, the that the sentiment is growing in a, in a broader pu- public awareness that things are, not as they should be, and that the media and the the, the power structures of government and, and banking and so on uh, are not in it for the good of the individual person, and, and you really need to take care of uh, business for yourself. So, you know, turning more to sort of the signs of the times of where popular sentiment can, can take uh, root, you'd st- we start to see some effects playing out in, in some of the markets. We've been told by Andy Hoffman and others like you can't watch the Dow Jones propaganda average because that one's just being propped up by the the Fed and the banks that work with them and so on but today uh, you mentioned in our talk before the show that there's a sign that there's a sign of life in a completely different part of the uh, financial world in the precious metals gold physical gold market can you talk to us about what uh, you observe today that we haven't seen in a long time absolutely and hey before I get into that just one thing about what you said about education of the country about financial matters. The educational systems always let the people down, even when it was a lot better than it is today. Just go back to the Great Depression. You know, there was no, no education about that, why it really happened and how it would be solved. The panic of 1907, all of these panics, nobody really understood what happened uh, during these financial panics, and nobody was very uh, forthcoming about uh, offering the public an explanation. So there's nothing new about that. But getting back to gold, yeah, it broke $1,300 per ounce today. I didn't have a chance to look and see what it closed, uh, but it was at around 1310 when I looked. It was up $20 the ounce. We haven't seen a... Uh, an increase like that in quite a while. And I mean, you know, it's gone up ten, twenty dollars an ounce a few other days during the year, but it's behaving in a totally different manner. The price we're seeing uh, higher highs and higher lows. And that is a, an indication that the trend has changed. And you know, gold in and of itself, you could make arguments what its value is, et cetera. And, you know, we'll never be on a gold standard again. I agree with that. But as a barometer of what people are thinking, sophisticated, wealthy investors, where you might be putting your money, I think it's very instructive. And just that it happens to break it now when things Things are really look like they're going downhill, you know, whether it's North Korea, Venezuela, whether it's the euro or the state of Illinois or Kentucky or whichever state's going to go belly up first. The situation has shown signs of deterioration. Debt continues to be manufactured at near record or near record levels, and it's not solving the problem of there is no wealth 
being created. Stock market, uh, I think there's a lot of reasons why it's gone up. I don't believe it's wholly manipulated. I think that there's a lot of money chasing less and less opportunities for returns. I'm not convinced that it's going to head downward here. I think it could still continue increasing the same time gold is going up, just like there'll be something that happens in Europe that will uh, affect the value of the euro, causing the dollar to go up. But the dollar can go up at the same time that precious metal prices go up. Uh, it's just the best, you know, the best looking uh, dirty shirt in the laundry, or the dry cleaner, you know. And so it's all these relative measures that make make a difference. Bitcoin, I think, cryptocurrencies, what I laughingly refer to as kleptocurrencies, most of them are fraudulent to the core. Maybe there's four or five good ones. I don't know. Uh, but there will be a role for cryptocurrencies in the future, especially ones that have no central authority controlling them, which the best one by far is Bitcoin. But it's not money yet. That's what you have to understand. It's not uh it's not worth the paper that it's not printed on. So, <laughs> you know, it's it, and I'm not putting it down by any stretch. I own a little bit. Um, I think it has value, but you can't go to the 7-Eleven and buy a cup of coffee with it yet. So therefore, it is not a medium of exchange. It has very limited uh, capabilities as a medium of exchange at this point doesn't mean that's not going to change so therefore it's not money in the classical sense of money because one of the primary functions of money is it's a medium of exchange gold and silver you know you can't go and spend them at the store either but it's much easier to convert them into currency and then go do it bitcoin it can really be a pain i mean i had people who said i was trying to sell six bitcoins a day at the exchange and they wouldn't do it. I had exceeded my maximum. So, so we've got a lot of interesting signs here. A lot of, uh, a lot of red flags, a lot of warning bells going off. But to think that the indication somehow is going to be that the stock market collapses, I'm just not buying into that because everybody said the stock market's going down since the crash and everybody, myself included, has been totally incorrect. Only two or three analysts out there have called the market properly uh, and the reasons why. Returning to one of the points that you covered uh, just now, you talked about the world economic status and that we're actually, you know, I think you mentioned just in summary, that we're not better off than we were uh, following the 2008 collapse. If you could kind of take us back there and and give us kind of the the key points because there was a very interesting article that came out five years after that, saying from some of the people who were uh, had been in the highest levels of government and banking decision making, saying that they were standing at that time on the edge of the abyss and looking into it and realizing that if they didn't take immediate emergency actions within a few hours, the entire global banking system could have collapsed in two thousand eight. So. What specific uh, differences are, are, are pointable that now that say that we're significantly worse off than we were in 2008? Well, the debt level obviously has gone way, way up. Um, the level of world trade is down. Uh, the employment numbers appear to be better, but they apparently are quite manipulated. The... Um, the workforce participation rate, at least until very recently, has not really gone up at all. And that's the percentage of people of the potential workforce who could be who are working. Uh, so if it's 110 million people and 60 million people are working, you know, it's it's like 62 or 3 percent, I think, was the last number I saw. So, you know, things like that. And then uh, certainly there's an increase in homelessness, increases in social unrest, crime, uh, lack of confidence in the institutions of society. 
greatly diminished, whether it's the police, whether it's the ability of the government to, uh, to protect us from threats inside, within or without. All of these things are, are there. And, you know, it's a lot easier to just bury your head in the sand and say, well, hey, the worst is over and we'll go on. But, but you have to understand that you could be wrong. And if you're wrong and you haven't uh, at least taken out, taken out some insurance, the results could be devastating. You know, it's interesting that one of the things you just said triggered a thought for me, the confidence in institutions of society being greatly reduced. Just a one little anecdote there that, that our viewers will be near and dear to their heart. Uh, four years ago, uh, near the beginning of this channel, we issued, we published an interview with a county sheriff who is uh, holds some national board positions among county sheriffs, and he's a real leader. And he comes on very powerfully speaking about his how he doesn't work for the governor, he doesn't work for the president, he doesn't work for the mayors, and he works for the people who elect him directly. And that the, that the sheriffs are the only uh, law enforcement uh, officers that are provided for in the, in the Constitution in most states and on and on, how they were the original ones, et cetera, et cetera. And when we published that uh, almost four years ago, it was about three and a half years ago, the, it got 150 thumbs up and zero thumbs down. We, <laughs> we republished it two weeks ago as an encore for some of our later subscribers, and the mix completely shifts. It's about four to one or five to one, thumbs up to thumbs down now, a, a, a huge increase in uh, negative opinions and, and comments to go with that about people's distrust of law enforcement and that sort of thing. I thought that was a, you know, it's, it's a tiny anecdote. It's one data point, but it is uh, uh, potentially a sign of the times of what you're talking about. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, uh, the former administration had a real war on the police going on. And look, there's plenty, there's plenty of things wrong with the judicial system, with law enforcement, and such. But until you come up with something better, uh, you better figure out how to make what we have work better. And it's largely a criminal justice problem, uh, more so than law enforcement. There just aren't all of these unwarranted shootings that take place constantly, like the media would have you believe. Yeah, that's the other thing. You, you mentioned social unrest and crime, and I thought I was going to ask you, what, in your opinion, of what portion of that is the is a perception fueled uh, by a narrative among media, and not just among media, but uh, also being funded and sponsored uh, uh, riots and that sort of thing over the last several oh. years. Yes, I mean you definitely have these rent a mobs, and uh, Charlottesville's a perfect example of a manufactured uh, crisis. You know, it just. The so-called white supremacists were a tiny little portion, but then, you know, 20,000 of these Antifa guys and Black Lives Matters guys show up and start uh, beating them to a pulp. And, of course, things get out of, out of hand. And that was deliberate, brought on by the governor of Virginia and uh, with his orders and the, probably the mayor of Charlottesville to stand down by the police to not to, to allow the crowds to mingle. Um, look, I mean, those guys are repugnant and uh, nobody supports them. They're a ragtag bunch of misfits, these neo-Nazis, and, uh, you know, no punishment uh, is too good for them. But uh, they had a permit, and uh, the town and the state totally mishandled it. And you saw it again in Berkeley. You know, they just don't rein in they're they're supporting left wing violence against against uh, people who whose rights are being infringed i mean you saw it in boston this group wasn't even ultra nationalists or whatever neo nazis all they were for was for freedom uh, freedom of speech and they wound up drawing a crowd because of the media 15,000 people show up to protest them and these guys were just pro-freedom, you know, nothing else. But the media totally warped the perspective. And that, you know, and that faith in government extends to faith in institutions of society, of which the press is certainly up there. And 
Congress, you have no faith in these people whatsoever. No faith in them to lead, no faith in them to exercise sound judgment and decision making. And that's just adding to the chaos and adding to the uncertainty and making this thing just look perhaps worse even than it is and and egging people on. And the best thing you can do is just turn off the conventional media. Don't watch their news shows. You know, their news shows are just lies and they're just out there actively lying and, you know, trying to commit you to their agenda, which is a really unsound agenda and really self-destructive and destructive to society as a whole. And this is all over the world. It's not just in the U.S. The media is has run amok. And, you know, not that the government can can do anything about it. It's kind of up to the people to uh, to really just make them unsound, untenable uh, investments that force them to uh, to close down. It's the legacy media. However, yet yeah, government may not be able to rein it in, but there's actually worse than that. There's an unholy alliance between the two. Um, you mentioned another example. You mentioned homelessness in passing, and we talked about in the previous administration the hockey stick increase in food stamp dependency and other types of financial dependency of the average uh, you know, lower half of the income scale on government for subsistence. And that whole... That whole uh, or you, whether you can look at that for Obamacare, you can look at it for these other topics, is there's always the front uh, poster, I won't say poster child, uh, using up the, the underprivileged person or the marginalized person or the poor person as saying, see, we have to have this, it's for their good. And that's kind of like the, the, the pawn, every look over here at the pawn and the chessboard. But the actual move seems to be to increase the uh, power, influence, and, and control that never will be lost then by those wielding the power by increased intrusion and overreach into the economy, into people's lives, taking away freedom, taking away liberty, taking away choice, taking away independence, and replacing it with dependence that's then enforced. Um, and you mentioned several times talking about the media being the ones to uh, propagate that message. So that's what we'd like to turn with our last question to you is how are independent media being punished for not propagating the dominant narrative? And are there specific examples in, in your life or in others that, that, that we've talked about uh, that, would, that you could bring forth? Oh, yeah. Well, the whole fake news thing, you know, Financial Survival Network, we were listed on some college professors, 1,000 top fake news websites, which I used, felt was a badge of honor. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, it's I saw it a long time ago with, you know, institutions like Google that just sandboxed my content. I used to get hundreds of thousands of downloads off of my videos. And now, you know, if I get 15,000 a month, 20 a month, I'm doing great. And I just I just produce YouTube uh, videos of my podcast as a byproduct, if you will. I post it to a site and it auto posts it to YouTube and I forget about it because I just don't really care. Uh, it's just a way for people to find out about me, the work that I'm doing and join our community. So, uh, but you know, now I, that was four years ago, they did it to me. Now they're doing it to everybody they don't like. I mean, that, that those African American girls, uh, diamond and silk, they were, their uh, videos were going viral. They were probably making some okay money off of their YouTube uh, revenue. And now that all of their videos, hundreds of them, have been demonetized. And it's happening over and over and over again. But aside from that, the trend is when Google needs more money, it appears to me that they just take it from their so-called content creators. They change the fees. They, they do something to pay you less money. And to pay, whether it's AdWords or whether it's uh, YouTube views with advertising, the trend has always been pay the content creators less and less. I mean, I knew people uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, getting $100,000 a month 
off of uh, AdSense uh, on their sites. And now they get, if they get 10 a month, they're doing well. These are people that had tens of thousands of URLs. But nonetheless, uh, it's just part of Google's uh, share the wealth. Only they'll just keep the wealth and they'll share a little bit with you. And they're the worst example of it. But Facebook's doing the same thing. Twitter, forget, you know, but Twitter's not really a practical ad platform and not a, a platform that'll generate revenue to you in the alternative media. But they're all doing it is the point. And I'll just conclude by saying they're being extremely, extremely short sighted. In my book, Viral Podcasting, I talk about this. And the, the moral of the story is you are a brand, whether you're, you're Google or whether you're FSN or Reluctant Preppers, you're a brand. And unless your subject matter is politics and, uh, you know, freedom, whatever, don't talk about it. Like in viral podcasting, I'm teaching people how to make their podcast go viral. I don't talk about my political views because they're irrelevant and it's irrelevant with Google. And so what they're successfully doing is alienating 50 percent or more of their customers, even though their customers don't pay money for it. And their customers, and same with Facebook, are going to go elsewhere. Now, Facebook kind of is smarter about it than YouTube. They're a lot sneakier. YouTube, Google just shut stuff down. You know, they just pull your money back and they'll, they'll just knock you off and uh, with no explanation. And then there's an outcry and they can't figure out that they're doing something wrong. Uh, Facebook is much more subtle and manipulative about it. They'll just manipulate the content coming to you to make you think reality is different than it is. Uh, they're in some ways more evil perhaps than Google and in other ways less so because they do let the content in. Uh, it's just they filter it in such a way that uh, to create impressions. You know, they, they have so much uh, consumer behavior data that, that they can appear to be a free portal, free and open, but they're really not. Google, like, you know where you stand with them because they just shut you down if they don't like you. <clears throat> Stop paying you money. But, uh, but you know, this is all, all part of it. But it's going to inure to their disadvantage because they will lose more than half their market. And options, substitutions will become available in the marketplace. And people will collectively, uh, you know, wave off Google and Facebook, and they'll go elsewhere. Just because these companies have huge market strength right now, it's not, it's not like they have a natural monopoly. They are subject. I mean, I remember 15 years ago, Microsoft had a monopoly. Yeah, that doesn't seem to be working out too well for them. The same is going to happen with Google, Facebook, Twitter. Others are going to come up that do something a little bit better and they will desert those platforms in droves. So it's very short-sighted, it's stupid, it's bad business, but hey, it's their business to screw up the way they want. From the standpoint of ordinary viewers who are listening to this right now, if they're interested in voting with their feet and going somewhere else, are there any ideas that you can offer them as far as places that they can go and find content that would be less uh, editorially uh, censored than what they'll find in those in the venues you've already described. Well, Vimeo is one uh, that's a private uh, video file sharing system. So you have to pay to store your videos there, but they do have a free aspect. And, and they're just as good as YouTube. Okay. YouTube, Google, number one, number two search engines. There's a bunch of search engines like Microsoft's is probably a little inferior Bing, but it doesn't outwardly have, uh, you know, an agenda, a political agenda. Uh, they, they've been too busy trying to get market share to worry about political agendas, right? Uh, as far as social media platforms, they'll be coming. I don't know of anything right now. But, you know, when you abuse the public's trust, 
and you try to play with their emotions and manipulate their beliefs, you're going to get called to account for it, and the results are not going to be pretty. Uh, I almost favor making them common carriers, making them, uh, you know, kind of like when you put something on a on a delivery service, they're a common carrier. They can't say, well, I'm going to treat the, uh, uh, you know, this company's mail better than yours because I like them better. Everybody gets treated the same. Shipping companies, they call them common carriers. And to some extent, uh, media outlets once upon a time were like that. Uh, it's been a little distorted with net neutrality, but we're going to return to this this concept of the common carrier where we carry everything and you figure out what you want to watch. We're not going to, uh, we're not going to do anything to change it. And, you know, that day's coming back and that movement is going to be so strong that it's going to knock them over because you don't have to go out and protest on a street corner. You just have to go switch. And when they start losing money, then they're going to have to rethink the entire strategy and they'll wind up like the legacy media, where in another couple of election cycles, they'll be completely irrelevant. Well, Kerry, before we let you go, you mentioned earlier that you suggest people, A, unplug from uh, corporate media, B, uh, find a way of ensuring their wealth. And can you can you offer just like one or two steps you think that are, that are sort of, how do you go, how do you go about that? Well, some, you know, like, Get your look. The human brain is set up so that when you read, when you read your information, you're automatically more critical than when you watch it or take it in passively. And that goes for for video, audio to some extent as well. In, in some ways, you can manipulate people more on audio than video. But uh, read your news. Don't don't get it spoon fed to you. Um, read it. And you'll automatically be a more critical thinker uh, because reading is, is not a passive uh, intake of data. Reading requires you to use your mind and search it out. So search out your channels. And, you know, everybody, I believe, should have a certain core physical metal holding. You might consider some Bitcoin as well. I don't think it's going away. That's for sure. I think it's... It's probably going to be the uh, the digital reserve currency, and you know just be prepared. That's it. I think uh, some survival implements in your house, tools, survival tools, a little bit of emergency preparedness food, all these things. They don't cost much to do, and just like insurance, you know, it might cost you a thousand dollars a year to insure your home, but uh, if you don't insure it. Uh, one fire will cost you uh, 300 times that or 500 times that in the form of a loss to your asset and all of your personal property. That's why we have insurance, so that uh, when the unlikely does occur, uh, it's not going to wipe you out financially, wipe out your family. You're ready for it. And I think we're in an era where you need other forms of insurance, financial insurance, and the best form of financial insurance for millennium is uh, precious metals. Can't make it any clearer than that. I'm not saying go sell everything and make a bet on it, but uh, have some so that you're always protected. You mentioned one thing before we let you go. I just thought about that. The uh, You mentioned about reading your news. Uh, many people may not be aware that, as you mentioned, our visual cortex that, that takes in most of the information that we process each day bypasses the centers of reasoning. It goes directly into a uh, comparison of you know past events and storage as far as meaningful, but it doesn't go through the reason filter. So it's absolutely uh, core and critical that people realize that the more and more we tend to rely on visual forms of input, the, the more subject we are to potential manipulation because it bypasses uh, reason when you're just using your visual input so good, oh, good point absolutely true and and there's so many people so many of you out there getting your all your information from facebook 
of all places, or YouTube. You know, it's supplanted television. And, no, you know, the reason why you can't trust the media is because you can't trust yourself to absorb information uh, critically from mass channels. That's the thing. It's not their fault, per se. They're pushing their agenda, and they know what they're doing. But it's your fault for not understanding what they're doing and how it's affecting you and how they bypass your reason. That's what they do. Just show a couple of kids being sick, and that's the justification for every social welfare program that's out there, including uh, Head Start, which has been a proven failure since its inception, or public education, or, you know, we can go down the list. And you just use the kids, and everything is justified. Well, Kerry, I think we're going to have to leave it there for tonight with our time running out. But if people want to find your work, and it sounds like most of your work is going to be uh, not necessarily what they'll find on YouTube, but uh, where can they find you and uh, get plugged in? Oh, sure. Yeah, just go to financialsurvivalnetwork.com, and it's all there. It's all free. We have sponsors, obviously. You know, we got to do something to keep the lights on. And then, you know, my podcasting consultancy, the book is viralpodcasting.com wrote that book so hey if you want to get into this make a career of it there's plenty of opportunity to do it and i teach you how not to be dependent upon too big uh, too big to fail corporations media corporations whatever how you actually do it on your own monetize your message and and earn a a very respectable income in the process well, Kerry Lutz, founder and host of the Financial Survival Network at FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. Thank you once again for joining us here on Reluctant Preppers. It's been a pleasure uh, working with you ever since we met you in person at the Liberty Mastermind Symposiums. And just thank you for all that you do to help get this uh, alternative media and independent media voice out there and keep it out there and help people be successful at keeping diversity uh, alive so that we're not you know, subject to just monoculture in our information sources and really can pursue the truth. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you for having me.